My name is Arjun Makijani. I'm president of the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research. Two books. This one is a historic book, literally. A Time to Choose became the foundation of President Carter's energy policy, which is the only energy policy we've ever had, in my opinion. In my right hand is the one I just did last year, Carbon-Free and Nuclear-Free, a Roadmap for U.S energy policy. I examined whether we could phase out the use of fossil fuels and nuclear power at the same time. And to my own surprise, actually, I concluded not only that we could, but that it could be done rather rapidly in 30, 40 years, and that it could be done economically. Well, how do you do it? So the foundation is efficiency. If, if you look at the carbon dioxide emissions, buildings produce more carbon dioxide than cars, for example, than any other sector of the U.S. economy, uh, commercial and residential buildings. Changing existing and new buildings does not need the federal government. Federal government can help. They can provide incentives. It's the state and local governments that are essential. I believe we need to move to electric cars and electric transportation. That's because electric cars can inherently be much, much more efficient than gasoline cars. Because when you have electricity powering the cars, then you can generate electricity from wind. Uh, you generate electricity from sunshine. Then you can put the sunshine in your tank, basically. That's the best way to power a car. Many people who are skeptical about renewables have said, well, it can be a small part of the energy sector, but it'll never be a big part of it. So for that, we need coal and nuclear oil. Of course, you have to have sufficient resources. So the first question is, do we have enough wind and sunshine? We have about as much wind energy potential to equal three times the total electricity generation of the United States. Solar energy is even more plentiful. A hundred mile by hundred mile area, a square hundred miles on the side in the southwest, could supply all of the electricity requirements of the United States. Of course, you have to build a transmission line. There's a lot of ancillaries. It's not necessarily the most desirable way to do it. All I'm saying is, this is the size of the resource. One of my favorite pieces in terms of how we should generate the electricity is on parking lots and rooftops. The area of commercial rooftops and parking lots and all the highways, you know, in the urban areas where you don't have to build new transmission lines, you don't need new corridors, if you take the available area into account, it can generate most of the electricity requirements of these areas. In the short term, I think solar cells in parking lots and rooftops and offshore wind can allow us to introduce very large amounts of renewables into the marketplace, even before we have a new infrastructure for transmission lines. Delaware has approved the first offshore wind project just about a month ago. I know a lot of people don't like the view. I personally think windmills are beautiful, wind turbines are beautiful, but really on the horizon they're quite small. And even if you don't like the view, I think it's part of the price we need to pay to make renewables come to market faster. People do live near the water on the Great Lakes and on the East Coast and the West Coast and the Gulf of Mexico. That's where the vast majority of the population is. So offshore windmill doesn't require a vast new transmission infrastructure. You have an underwater cable that comes to shore and you can hook in with the distribution system of the city. I think we should build coastal and offshore wind turbines along all of the coasts. And people who don't like the view should remember that if they stop these things because of the view, that they're really advocating either more climate change or kicking plutonium down the road to our kids. I don't think that's an acceptable answer. What are the problems with nuclear power? Plutonium is a big one. Every year, every nuclear reactor say a thousand megawatts, typical size, would generate about 40, 50 bombs worth of plutonium. In, in the course of its operation, it just happens whenever you have uranium fuel, part of the uranium becomes plutonium, and when the fuel has to be removed because it is used, used up, 
about 1% of the spent fuel is plutonium. All commercial reactors generate plutonium. Plutonium is unavoidable. The plutonium in the reactor spent fuel is not usable directly in bomb. You first have to separate that 1%, which is a dangerous and costly process. But the French are doing it. The British are doing it. The Russians are doing it. The Indians are doing it. The Japanese are doing it. It did used to be done in this country. Uh, fortunately, no longer done in terms of commercial plutonium separation. Now, once you separate the plutonium, you can make bombs with it. It's a very significant proliferation liability. So reprocessing has a lot of downsides. You recover weapons usable material and you put it in circulation in the commercial economy. Uh, you encourage others to do the same. It doesn't get rid of the problem of nuclear waste because you're only using 1% of the spent fuel. What about the other 99%? Reprocessing doesn't solve the problem of long-term management of nuclear waste. You still need a repository. The French reprocess but the French need a repository, and it's very interesting that when it comes to nuclear waste, the French are as allergic to having it nearby as anybody else. They're, well, it's all stored at the reprocessing plant instead of at the reactor. Now, you use plutonium as a fuel, and it generates spent fuel. That spent fuel has more plutonium in it than regular uranium spent fuel. And what are you going to do with that? Or the most of the uranium in France, it's just sitting around, unused. On top of it, they discharge 100 million gallons a year, approximately, of liquid wastes into the English Channel, and they have polluted the oceans all the way to the Arctic. Almost no one in this country understands this or knows it. They all say, well, we should do like the French. You know, we should be like the French. And I'm saying, I don't think so. Take a good look. Don't just read the PR. <laughs> all of this material is on our website. The references are provided. Plutonium is a health risk, a proliferation risk, and it doesn't solve the waste problem. So people who say that reprocessing is recycling are very mistaken. They're at least 99% wrong, because only 1% of the spent fuel is plutonium. So you can reuse that as a fuel. You're making more plutonium all the time as you, as you uh, operate a reactor. That's why I'm also opposed to generating more and more nuclear waste and building more and more reactors, because there's really no good solution to this problem. I think the answer to liquid fuels lies in aquatic plants. You know, pond scum, cattails, um, water hyacinths. These are all very, very prolific plants. They don't need agricultural land or any land. They grow in the water. You can turn these microalgae into fuel either for electric power generation or into liquid fuels or into gaseous fuels. You can do biogas plants. There are at least two companies that are making what's called green crude. They grow microalgae and then they produce a crude oil from microalgae that is a lot like petroleum. So it can be used in existing refineries and you can make gasoline and diesel and kerosene and so on out of a jet fuel, industrial fuel and so on. And this is a biofuel. So the, the, the range of technologies to solve the problem is here. The main problem is the guts, the political guts. The main thing that has to happen is a price on carbon dioxide. Today you can burn coal and emit CO2 and not have to pay for it. There's no tax on it. There's no price on it. The other job to be done is we have to be serious and stop subsidizing fossil fuels and nuclear energy. If we're serious about getting rid of these things, we have to stop throwing money at them. The oil companies get lots of tax breaks. For example, nuclear energy gets free insurance from the government. The industry is pushing for much, much larger loan guarantees, open-ended for, for many more plants. The nuclear industry people themselves have said that they will not build new nuclear power plants without loan guarantees and my answer to that is fine. We don't need it. If the U.S. does take this bold step with renewable fuels, I think people will be waiting in line to work with the United States to get it done in other countries as well.